Welcome to episode number seven of the National Land Realty Podcast, where we discuss all things land. Our goal here is to inform, educate, and entertain those of you who own land or are interested in the buying and selling of land throughout the United States. My name is Mac Christian, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at National Land Realty, and I will be your co-host for this episode because joining me today is Bryce Berglund. Bryce works as the Content Marketing Specialist here at National Land Realty. Now, today our topic will be timber investments, where we will learn about how to buy or sell timber-rich land, the valuation of timber, and the maintenance of timber investments. Our guest today is Warren Peters out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Warren has over 50 years of experience in forestry. He started cruising timberland with his father when he was just 14 years old, and all these years later, Warren still loves working with trees. Warren earned a Bachelor of Science in Forestry from Louisiana State University in 1981. He is a licensed broker in both Louisiana and Mississippi, a registered forester, and holds the ACF designation as a member of the Association of Consulting Foresters, and is a state certified general real estate appraiser in Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. This man carries immense knowledge about timber, so when he talks, it's best to listen. Now, sit back and enjoy the show. Okay, so we're sitting here with Warren Peters. Uh, Warren has a lot of experience in forestry, and instead of me picking through your your background and, and your resume here, Warren, why don't you tell me a bit about your background in forestry specifically, um, and and sort of a your your sort of professional journey to to coming on board with National Land. Okay. Well, I've, I've officially been in, in the forestry business for about 40 years, unofficially for about 50 to 55 years. My father was, was a, a consulting forester as well. And, and, you know, when I got big enough and strong enough to tag along, I went with him on summers and weekends and holidays. And, and I tell people that they don't generally believe me, but I was cruising timber when I was about 14 years old. Um, didn't do much. I was kind of to drop off and pick up guy for the crew. And they say, here, we'll take these few plots at the end of the road and come back and, and just be back here at three o'clock. And so, you know, I got started in the business young. Uh, it's too stupid, I guess, to do anything else. I got a brother that ended up being a surgeon. So I don't know what that says <laughs> about the family, but that's what it is. Uh, so, but I've been here. Uh, I call myself a forestry consultant. Worked for a family business uh, called Bennett and Peters Incorporated, you know, from when I was a kid. Got out of school in 1981 and worked there till about 1996. Uh, obviously, we own, our family owned part of that business, but we decided it would be best if I left and started my own business. In 96, we started Peters Forest Resources. My dad worked at Bennett and Peters for about another six months, retired, stayed retired about six months, and he came to work for me. So uh, it kind of came full circle. And now my son is working for me as well. So we got third generation in this business. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, we've done a lot over the years in that business. Obviously, we manage a lot of privately owned non-industrial timberlands. Currently, we're managing about 70,000 acres. Uh, and we're still operating that business as well as operating an office for national land. Um, I've also done quite a bit of timberland appraisal work in my life. Um, you know, I've, I've been a certified appraiser for almost 40 years, stuff from small, re, you know, recreational tracks up to large industrial 200,000 acre plus tracks. So I've seen quite a few different aspects of, of the forest industry and, and all of it's related, you know, to the real estate industry. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. I've, I've, I've got a lot of miles on my boots, a lot of, a lot of pairs of boots actually. So, um, so was it a natural progression then? Like, so starting out in forestry and kind of going into the family business, did you just kind of like fall into the real estate side of it then through national land or? Well, you know, we, 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 we had a broker's license for, for years and years and, and we just didn't use it often. We used it once or twice a year to take care of a client that wanted to sell or wanted to buy something else. And it, it was just kind of sitting there on the shelf to use when we needed to. And, 
And we got to looking around a few years back on ways to, you know, diversify the business and, and increase our revenue and, and real estate. It was just a natural extension of what we were doing. It's, it wasn't much different than what we were doing. It's just an avenue we didn't utilize. And so we talked and, and we, we were doing it for ourselves. And, and then uh, Mark Lewis actually out of Mississippi showed up in my office one day and convinced me to join National Land Realty. Uh, it took me a few months to figure out that that was the best model for us. And, and so we did. I, you know, the Mark Lewis story has seemed to keep spreading. We had our national conference this year. And they asked for a show of hands on how many people came on board because of him and another and Ronnie Richardson. Ronnie Richardson. Yeah. And but but Mark in particular, about half the crowd raised their hand. I think that he is probably the single best recruiter. <laughs> he, he seems to get in people's ears. He, he's good at that. He's good. At, you know, anything requires uh, a lot of words and a lot of convincing. Mark's pretty good at it. Yeah, he is. He's very Mark, could sell, Mark could sell, I think, a bridge in, in uh, Wyoming to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. Um, so, yeah, so so you came on board with National Land. And, and so you've worked primarily most of your career in, in the Louisiana, Mississippi areas. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. You know, we, we, you know, we, we stray. You know, on the, on the forestry side, we'll stray into Texas and Arkansas occasionally. Occasionally, we went into Alabama and further, but those were one-off jobs that, you know, were just, you know, good, quick, high-paying jobs, and we'd go do those. And we'll still go do them if they're high-paying. And that just mostly is valuation kind of stuff? Valuation or some timber inventory work. For a while, we did a lot of, in, a lot of inventory, timber inventory or timber cruises, as some people may know, uh, for the large uh, timberland investment management groups and that sort of stuff. Okay. And so, and, and just to kind of clarify, I, I like to kind of speak to an audience in, in terms of imagining that they don't have experience in the areas that we're discussing. So when we're talking about a timber property, uh, you know, cut me in on your definition of, of what constitutes a timber property that you would assess or manage. Uh, I would say, you know, it, it's got to have obviously a viable commercial stand of timber or potentially have that, you know, have a viable commercial stand of timber. And, and to do that, you've got to have, you know, the right species, you've got to have the right type of property that, that can grow timber at a reasonable rate. And you've also got to be in the right market areas. Uh, like I said, most of our work is in Louisiana and, and South Mississippi. Uh, by and large, those areas are, are uh, very, very good timber growing areas. Obviously, South, stream South Louisiana. Not so much, you know, you get south of Baton Rouge where I am, uh, you don't have a lot of timber, you have some swamp and you have a lot of marsh, but from Baton Rouge north in Louisiana, I 10 north in Louisiana, uh, timber growing, I mean, the timber industry in Louisiana is one of the largest industries in the state. So what would, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm a stranger to the industry, um, why would somebody invest in timber or, or purchase and I, and I get that a lot of people will acquire land, not really realizing that they have sort of commercial grade timber on it, or they, they pick up the land being told that they have commercial grade timber with a particular side index. Um, so if, if somebody was coming into it, one, why would they own it? And two, why would they harvest it? Well, you know, timberland, you know, let's look at it from two ways. Timberland is timberland, and then there's what I call recreational timberland. Timberland and the primary driving force is, is you're growing timber. That's your income source. Um, that's the, the primary reason you, you bought it, uh, yeah. was a timber investment. Recreational timberland, it's, it's, it's a, a two sided page. You've got your recreation, whether you're hunting on it or just have a weekend place or fishing lakes or whatever, or you lease it out to hunters. Plus you have the timber. And so it, you know, you, you've got two sources of, of, potential income there obviously to maximize both you got to you got to give up something on the other side you know you got to you got to strike a balance uh, but timberland in general uh, timberland investment is is a really good hedge investment and i say that it's it's a great hedge on inflation you know if you compare it to other investments you know let's say gold for instance 
you know, obviously gold has been going kind of crazy right now and all investments are kind of crazy right now, but whether it's gold or stocks, if you, you sit there and you hold them and all you're going to do is wait for the price to go up or go down, you've got no control. You know, it goes up or goes down. With timber, you sit there and do nothing, assuming the price doesn't change, it's going to go up in value because it grows. You know, stocks, you know, unless you buy some more, you don't get any more of it. Timber, if you do nothing, you get more of it. It just continues to grow. And, and so let's say stock uh, price is static. In five years, you're going to have a more valuable asset if you do nothing to it. Uh, you know, apps in a hurricane or, or, or some disaster. In addition to the biological growth, as trees grow, they, they get bigger and move from one product to another product. And the next product, the bigger product, is more valuable in itself. So let's take a pine tree. If it goes from, say, 10 inches in diameter to 12 inches in diameter, it may go from $6 a ton to $12 or $14 a ton just by the mere fact that it got bigger. And the same thing, you know, if you go on up the diameter class bigger, let's say you go up to a 15-inch diameter tree, it's twice as much as the 12-inch as the, as the diameter tree. So you've got biological growth, and you've got product shift or in growth. Both of those two are going to happen no matter what you do. And so even in a declining market, you've got some hedge against that price loss. And then the third way, you know, you've got, lately we haven't had it, but over time you'll get price appreciation. So there's, there's three opportunities to, to gain value just in the timber itself. You've also got the opportunity for price appreciation in the land. So, in Timberland, you've got the opportunity for four different asset appreciation angles there compared to, you know, the stock market or gold or something else that all you've got is one. All you've got is price appreciation. Sure. So, I mean, going off of what you had said earlier, uh, it sounds like, you know, if you're looking at a timber property, uh, if you can find something that has, you know, marketable timber on it that also has space for recreation, it's kind of a win-win. It is, um, particularly in most of our, our, what I said earlier, recreational timberland tracks are bought by folks that are going to do the recreation themselves. They're either going to build a family camp out there, they're going to go hunting, uh, fishing, camping, whatever they want to do out there. And so, you know, there again, you compare that to, uh, an investment in stock market or gold, it's kind of hard to go sit in a deer stand on a stock certificate. You know, they just, you know, they don't, it's hard to put a deer stand in the right place. And so, you know, and if you don't use it yourself, you've got lease income. Most timberland properties have, have the ability to generate lease income. It may, it may be a few dollars an acre, but around here, around Baton Rouge, between Baton Rouge, North of us, on up into Southwest Mississippi, it's very common to, to generate thirty dollars per acre per year off of a hunting. In you know, some other parts of the state, you know, central where where it's primarily pine, commercial pine plantations and stuff, lease rates may be five or six dollars an acre, but in, in some places they're very high. Is that due to the type of wood, or is it due to the density? It it's. It, it, in these areas, north of Baton Rouge, only, only in the Mississippi, it's it's a more diverse habitat. Uh, the, the 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 hunting is a lot better, uh, a lot more quality deer hunting, a lot higher deer populations, and, and therefore you're generating a lot higher uh, interest. I, I was going to say, and I need to I need to walk that back because I was asking you, like I was thinking more on the timber perspective than the leasing right. perspective. So you, so yeah, I get that. Yeah, you know, and 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 you know, the recreational properties regardless of the timber sell for a lot higher prices and they're closer to back they're closer to town they're closer to the urban centers and they're closer to population so you've got a lot you know it's just a lot easier if you're going to buy a place that's a recreational timberland track you want to be able to get there without driving a half of that i got you so so when you go into a property um you know this is kind of jumping right into it but you know, how do you, in, in a, you know, terms like site indexing are not going to be familiar to everybody. So, right. 
So let's walk through like, how do you evaluate what is a timber stand worth? Like if you're walking in from the outside, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people will buy land and I've, I, I have talked to property owners. I live up in the Northwest who will, who will purchase and like, I've got timber. I thought about selling it. And you, you look at it, you know, there's like an acre of sparsely grown right. trees that are very short that, you know, the, you got a good 30 years until you can harvest that. So, so, you know, one, how do you evaluate it? And two, like, and what we're talking about is site indexing, but like from, from a layman's point of view, you know, if you could walk me through how you go about it and what, what you're looking at. Well, we're looking at, at, at the site index and I real quickly site index is, is a way to measure productivity of a site and, 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 the way you measure site index is is you, you measure the height of, or of, of the dominant trees at either age 25 or 50 in the south. Sometimes it's 100 out in the northwest. But so, you know, how tall can a pine tree grow in 25 years or how tall can that red oak grow in, in 50 years? And obviously, the faster, they, the higher they grow in that, in that time period, the faster they're growing, the more productive, productive the site is. And and so that's it, it's a real simple way to measure site product productivity, and it's 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 not measuring what's there today, but it's measuring the potential of what you can grow and how fast you can grow it. So it's future. You measure, essentially measuring the ability of the property to generate future returns. Sure. So um, how often would you how often would you perform a site index? You know how, how often do you need to be keeping index, an eye on that? The site index is generally inherent on a property or, or I mean, it's going to vary across the property, but it's, it's, a, it's a measure of the site productivity of the soil. So it's not going to change very often. So once you know the site index, you can change it some with some fertilization and some, hurt, some intensive management. But in general, it's going to stay about the same unless you get real intensive with your management. And so you've got that, and then you can go in and do a timber inventory, or some people call it a timber crew. You can actually go do a statistical sample, measure a certain percentage of the trees, whether it's five percent, ten percent, and and estimate the current volume of timber by species and by product on a particular piece of property. And so that'll give you the current market value of the timber. And then a professional forester can say, like, you know, you've got this. Here's your potential. Here's the management techniques we need to do to reach that potential. Or maybe you've already reached the potential and we just want to manage it to make sure you stay at that potential. So you mentioned management of the timber. So, so not only, and again, kind of, you know, I'm going to throw these out there for you. Um, You know, not only do you just own the trees, but you do need to manage the timber itself. And what I'm, what I'm thinking that you're lead, what, that you're talking about is like you know the spacing between trees, the undergrowth, that kind of thing, and and there's probably way more to that. I mean, I'm I'm you know I'm taking shots in the dark here, but like so, how would how do you go about setting aside a management plan, and and what would that yeah. entail? I mean, you know, to manage timber, you know, you're trying to maximize the average growth rate over the life of the timber stand, and so. We refer back to site index. Well, you this, that site's only going to support so much timber. And if the timber gets to that point, the growth rate's going to slow down. And your growth rate is essentially your return rate. And so you want to, you know, the way to manage timber is with harvest. And, and as that timber stand starts approaching its maximum capacity on that site, you want to go in and do a harvest. Where they probably, you know, you'll do some thinnings, and at some time, you, at some point, you'll do a final harvest and start over. But you go in, and before it's the growth rate slows way down, you thin it and take some of that volume off of that acre, and the residual timber now has the resources to grow at its maximum rate. And so, keeping that rate of growth or your rate of return up is the key to maximizing your t- return on timber investment. So to establish how much you thin timber, are you using crown spacing or are you using distance between between trunks or what's what's your sort of basis to thin out a timber? It's, it's more related to crown spacing. Uh, crown spacing is harder to measure. We generally measure it by what we call basal area, which is, is trunk area. If you cut all the trees off at four and a half feet above the ground, 
and measured the surface area of every stump. That's going to give you a certain square footage per acre. It may be 80 square feet per acre or, 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 or whatever. And we kind of measure it based on that. But ground spacing has more to do with timber growth than trunk to trunk spacing. Because you got to have room for the trees, you know, for the crowns to spread, the crowns to breathe. If the crowns get crowded, they have less foliage. Uh, and, and it grows, roughly it slows down when the crown, when they lose their foliage. Right. The photosynthesis slows down because they have less leaves and the growth rate slows down. And that's, and that's something to think about too, when you're talking about timber, just like with any plants, like it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of a full contact sport with all plants at the same time fighting for the same sunlight. So they have to have that space to get the sunlight. Exactly. For food. exactly. And, and, you know, relating that back to a recreational timberland track, wildlife habitat, let's talk about deer. I mean, most people deer, most, you know, deer hunt, turkey, whatever. And the deer feed on the ground. They don't feed in the tops of the trees. And so if you let the trees continue to grow and the canopies close together, it shades everything out and nothing's growing on the ground. It may be the most beautiful stand in the world, but you're not going to have any deer there because there ain't anything to eat. You put space in the ground, and now you've got sunlight all the way down to the ground, which creates growth or new browse on the ground for the deer to eat. Right. And, and, you know, we, what's, what's interesting about that too, and this is really useful is that we did a previous episode on prescribed burning and managing right. undergrowth and talking about how you, you want to, you want to manage that undergrowth to make sure that animals have fresh food to eat and you don't get that, that brush to where like they can't walk through it and they can't find the food, that sort of thing too. Right. Same thing. And, and, and even, but if you don't have sunlight just, and burn it, you're still not going to get maximum growth. You got to have sunlight for, plants to grow, most plants to grow. So when you're, when you're talking about managing the crown, the crown space of, a, of, of timber, you're not just accounting for, so like, let's say, I'm going to use silly numbers here. Like, let's say they're, you know, crown, average crown size at a particular age is 10 feet. Like you're not butting them right up against each other. You want gaps in there to allow sunlight, sunlight through to the, to the very bottom of the forest floor, right? Absolutely. And, and, and you know, that, that's, Primarily, well, it's not primarily, but that helps the wildlife, as we just mentioned, but it gives that crown t places to spread and lets the tree grow. If the crown can't spread, the tree's not going to grow much because it's not increasing its foliage and the photosynthesis is going to slow down. Right. So it, it sounds like, you know, if you, if you properly manage a timber property, you might come out on the other side with a pretty nice hunting property as well. Absolutely. The, the management of the two go hand in hand. And if you go look, you know, we're talking about this, you know, trees not growing, you'll look at a, a real beautiful stand, let's say around here north of Baton Rouge, and it's mostly oaks. And some of them may be 20 inches in diameter. Some of them may be 10 inches in diameter. Some of them may be 15 inches in diameter. There's a high likelihood that they may be nearly the same age. It's just the bigger trees had more space to grow. So it's yeah. It's, so size is not always an indicator of the age of the tree. It could be just the spacing that it has. That's correct. Um, so when you're when you're figuring out a side index or or you know is obviously the the species of tree is going to factor in your density in there. Um, what's what's sort of like your high value trees that you see? I mean, you're, you're probably going to have to speak given to your area. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm just assuming with your experience, you probably have a pretty good grasp of, of most of the species out there. So like, what's, what's your yeah, highest I mean, yield? I mean, here in, in Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, red oak has, has generally been king for a while as far as hardwood. And I'm going I'm to I'm distinguish between the hardwood or the deciduous trees and the pine trees or, or the con conifers. Hardwood is used for furniture and some some of the visible stuff, some of the hidden stuff. It's used for railroad ties. It's you know, and, and it's a different market than the pine market. So in in the hardwood market, red oak is, has been a dry red oak, ash. There's just not a huge component of ash down here. Those two and and, and cypress at times have been the drivers uh, of of the, the market. That's generally where your high values are, and those are the species we generally try to manage for. Oaks on the other also are a, a real good wildlife habitat species. So that, that's great that you can do both managing for oaks. Stuff, other stuff, what we you know lump in miscellaneous hardwoods, you got elms, 
gums, some oak species, sycamore, that sort of stuff. You know, they're, they're valuable, but not as valuable. They tend, tend to use that stuff for industrial grade material or, or hidden parts of furniture. Uh, on the other hand, you got pine trees or conifers. Uh, that stuff's primarily used for construction material. You know, dimension lumber, two by fours, two by sixes, four by fours, uh, plywood, OSB, that sort of stuff. And, and it's, uh, Years ago, it was more valuable than, than most hardwoods, including oaks. That's not the case anymore. But you can still, because pine trees grow a lot faster and you can grow more on an acre, you can still generally grow more income growing pine trees than you can grow a hardwood tree. Gotcha. And, and how, much, how, much is, uh, like, how much is water an influence on like, so site indexing or or the, the valuation of, of a timber stand? You know, soil moisture is critical. You got to have soil moisture. Um, you know, and, and, and so, but you don't want too much. Wet sites are, are not good either. Moist sites are sites with water available generally all the time is what you want. Uh, you, you know, and, and on a single piece of property or, or, or say on, on four or five acres, you might have, you know, the top of the ridge may not be as good as, as lower down on the ridge or down in the bottom between the ridges where there's more moisture. Uh, particularly in pine sites, you know, higher up on the, on the elevation you go, the lower the site index, typically. Gotcha. So, and I'm trying to think of my way through this from like a, like a purchasing standpoint. Like if I'm an investor um, and, and I'm wanting to purchase, uh, you know, a lot or a parcel with timber, um, you know, what are, what are the things I need to look for? And, th- and there's a few things in there that I, I had never considered before sort of like, you know, joining up in this industry and, and realizing like proximity to a mill is, is one thing that, that I never would have thought of, but like, what are some other, like, or, or if you feel like that's not as important, I don't know. Um, uh, proximity to the mill is critical. Um, you know, I can tell you, you know, specifically here, uh, Southeast Louisiana, around Baton Rouge and, and Southwest Mississippi, you know, there's been a devoid of, of mills here for the last 10 years. Uh, we've had several closures and some consolidations. And, you know, the difference of price between something that's 40 miles from a mill and something that's 100 miles from a mill, maybe 25%. That much. That much. Mm. It didn't use to be, I mean, because prices are depressed, so the, the, the difference is exaggerated in a percent. You know, let's, for instance, if I got something within 40 miles of the mill, say uh, nice mature pine saw logs, I could probably sell those, you know, money to the landowner at $28, maybe $30 a ton. If it's 100 miles from the mill, it's going to be $20, $22 a ton. And that's due to transport costs mostly? Right. or okay. And transport costs. What are some other things that can really impact the uh, the price that you're getting for your timber? Well, the the volume that you're selling. Uh, first of all, the quality of what you're selling, the species of what you sell. Species price prices vary greatly, particularly in the hardwoods. Uh, quality, uh, how much grade lumber that they can cut out of the out of the timber is a huge has a huge impact on it. Uh, the size, like I said, uh, when we first started, you know, small trees, eight, 10 inches in diameter are pulpwood trees. They go to the paper mill, get ground up for paper, six, eight dollars a ton. Smaller trees, 12 to 15 inches, typically go to what we call a small saw log or a chipping saw mill, and they cut mostly two by fours and four by fours out of that stuff. That might be worth 15, 16 dollars a ton. It gets up in that 15 inch diameter class and, and larger. They're cutting grade lumber out of it, you know, the two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens. Uh, you know, that's going to be worth, you know, in the mid 20s per ton, 25, $26 a ton. And you mentioned grade for timber. What are the grades and how do you grade those? It, it's everybody's uh, got a different grading system. <laughs> Essentially, it, it boils down to how many, not how straight the trees are and how many knots are in the tree. And, you know, the more knots, the, more, the limier the wood is, the more knots it is. And, and you know, you go to Home Depot and buy, you know, look at the lumber stack and all the ones with the knots are thrown on the ground. And they don't, you know, 
it's the same anywhere. You know, more knots is, is lower grade. Nobody wants nobody wants to look at. So the, so the next question to, I was I, I probably was leading that a little bit was can you influence the grade of your lumber? Can you influence the grade of your timber? Or is it just something where you're hoping on on luck there? Or are there things that you how, how do you manage that? There's some things you can do. Um, you know, some of it is in is genetically imprinted, and it's not gonna get around the genetics. Uh however, if you're if you're doing final hard clear cuts and replanting. You can control your genetics because you can go buy certain genetically uh, you know, designed trees. So there's some influence there. You can get the right genetics. Um, spacing, the further apart the trees grow, the, lim- the, the, the limier they are, and the more knots they generally have because they don't sell, they don't help each other prune. You got a lot of space between trees. Obviously, you're gonna have a bunch of sunlight, which that's too much sunlight because now all the limbs on the side of the tree won't sell prune. If you think about it, a tree in your yard has got limbs almost all the way to the ground because there's nothing on the side of it shading those lower limbs. You take that same tree and if it grows in the forest, it's not going to have limbs for the first 40 or 50 feet. That's it's about a much better gray tree than the one in your yard. So the, so the shadow created by other trees helps improve the grade of the tree because it doesn't need those lower limbs. It, it, those lower limbs get shaded out and they just, you know, they, 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 they can't grow. They can't, limbs don't grow in the, sh- in the shade. The leaves don't work in the shade. So the tree just jettisons those limbs. It doesn't, doesn't need them anymore. That's, that is also something I never would have thought of, but it makes total sense. Um, you want trees growing for the growing, you want that sunlight above them. You want them reaching for the sky. So they grow straight and tall. Now, granted, we talked about spacing trees out. You got to have some space between them so they grow and they maximize their potential. But don't you want too much space? Because yeah, they, so if you overspace, you end up with lower limbs. Yeah. Right. Okay. That so is, it really is. It really is a kind of balance between you know, right. too close and too far. Correct. So when when somebody is looking at the potential of of a timber investment, right? So they purchased land or whatever. Um, what's some what's some red flags? Like, what do you want to run away from? Like it's on fire. Like, <laughs> what's what's the things to avoid? Well, if it's if it's two hundred miles from the nearest mill, don't don't even go there because they're not coming to you unless it's black walnut or something in Indiana. Because um, is that because of the rarity of the species or yeah right okay. But down here, you know, if it's really, if it's more than a hundred miles or so from the mill, I'd, I'd be cautious about it. Um, now we're by, we're getting a lot more mills built now. There's just a whole bunch of new announcements and new mills under construction right now. So that's going to help. But um, conditions, site conditions, particularly like here in South Louisiana, we have a lot of properties that have just gorgeous cypress trees on them. and cypress right now is, is pretty valuable stuff uh it's not as valuable as the old world was but the problem is a lot of that cypress is growing in conditions that you can't cut you know it's 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 swamp and there's nobody has the equipment these days to go operate in that swamp so you know the, the timber you could say on paper it's, it's a lot of volume there and it's worth a lot of money but if you can't get to it, you can't, it's not worth anything in reality. You can't, you know, can't log it. And the other thing, I get, you know, this is kind of from the real estate side. If, if somebody says it's virgin timber, it's probably a red flag. <laughs> There's no virgin timber for sale anymore. <laughs> you get an agent advertising something with virgin timber on it, there's it, it, something wrong. They, they, don't, they don't know what they're talking about. And, and you know, the trees themselves probably have never been cut, but that's not virgin timber. I got it. virgin timber. Oh, sorry. Virgin timber is a place that's never, ever been cut. That's the trees that God put there, you know, originally. And, or they were there when the Indians were there. Do they do, two stands of that in my entire life. Do they, do they juxtapose that with old growth? Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's most people, and, and that's legitimate. Old growth is generally, you know, virgin timber, old growth, they're kind of synonymous. But, you know, you get a lot of uninformed 
folks that, you know, they got, you know, these nice pretty trees and, and they just, they don't know what they're talking about. And they, they you know, they try to pump it up. <laughs> all the birds in um, I, a couple questions arose just out of what you were just saying. So one, I got to know, like you were talking Cypress, what is, is there a method for taking trees out of a swamp? Like, are you, I, I, I go immediately to helicopter logging, but then you can't limit before you take it. So wh what is the process of this? It's well, back in the, in the early eighties, we actually did some, and we, for about 10 years, we tried to helicopter log Cypress down. And we would put, you know, guys out in the woods and they would do the felling and the topping in, you know, standing in the water. Um, and most of those crews came from the Northwest. And, but it just proves too expensive uh, for the, you know, for the, from the end product, it, it just, it was costing them too much money. Um, I think one particular sawmill, three different owners went bankrupt. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of cypress on ground that's accessible. It dries up every year, or there's it's not, you know, you can cut a lot of cypress. Uh, but there's a lot of it south in South Louisiana and some in South Mississippi that the conditions are such that you just can't go go cut it. You know, they, they, they learn the hard way. Literally destroying the work. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say they learn the hard way to work smarter, not harder, right? That's right. And it's just it's just way too expensive to try to go and harvest that stuff. How much what are some? Go ahead, Bryce. I was just going to ask, um, what are some other kinds of scenarios where you know timber is inaccessible or unharvestable? Um, you know, there's some places around it that you can't get there by. You know, you can only get there by boat. It would it would require barge operations, and there's a few barge operations operating up down the Mississippi River. But that's expensive. But, but there's a whole lot of areas in Louisiana that are just inaccessible to, to vehicle vehicular traffic. And so those, it, it's not that you can't do it; it's just too expensive to go. I just had. I was about to ask along those exact same lines because I was asking going to ask about like the steepness of the hills. You know how much that plays a role, and does that like when you're looking to evaluate a place? Do you look at like the steepness of the hill, or do you just or do you factor in that they're probably going to run a skid trail in there? No, we look at that. Um, you know, people don't think that Louisiana, Mississippi is having, having steep hills on. <laughs> Certainly not compared to Idaho. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there are places uh, in the, what we call, refer to as the hills, uh, starting up there and, and, and just north of Baton Rouge and running up the east side of the Mississippi River up towards almost to Memphis. And, and while the hills aren't very tall, you know, they may be 50 or 60 feet tall, they're very, very steep. And there's not a lot of logging contractors that have the equipment that can operate on those steep hills. You know, rubber tire skidders are dangerous on steep, steep, you know, if you got a 45% slope, it's dangerous to operate on. And some of those are 45% slopes. Uh, there's a few people that have, have tracked equipment that can cut it, but that stuff's expensive to purchase and expensive to operate. And those so are probably are places say that where it's steep. The right, right. limits what you can do. I was going to say in a steep terrain, it's probably more of a high line scenario. Is that like we don't run any high lines here because there's so much area that I mean you can just avoid the steep slopes. I mean there's so much <laughs> timber down here. You just no, it's a steep slope. We're not going to fool with. I was going to say. I mean, to me, the, the, this you get into you get into the the country in Louisiana and stuff. To me, if I was walking somewhere like the poisonous snakes and alligators, would pretty much mean it was inaccessible to me. Well, <laughs> I tell people if you worry if you worry about snakes, just don't look for them. Don't, <laughs> don't look down. Uh, it terrifies me, man. Um, so when when somebody is is looking at at you know purchasing like a timber investment or or you know even coming in as a group do you do you see that more often like an individual or do you see groups uh i probably see more individuals uh, you know we get some groups uh and if you're talking commercial timber investments it may be a small corporation it may be a family corporation or or what we've seen i've seen a good bit here in the last 15 years or so is Corporations kind of create a, 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 a affiliated company and they're taking profits and buying some timberland as a way to, to diversify their portfolio. You know, we have a, core, a company here in Louisiana that over the last 
20 years is probably, well, they went from zero acres up to almost 100,000 acres, and they just, they're funding that with profits from their primary business. So somebody purchasing a, a timber property or, or, you know, a timber stand, how would somebody go in, find land with timber, and then find someone to harvest it? Because I think that's that's one of the that's one of the things coordinating that maybe somebody wouldn't think right. about is that you you get you get a place and you think, oh, cool, I'll harvest the timber. Well, there's there's other steps involved in the process. You got to find somebody to come in, cut that for you you get a portion of the cost, sort of like it's the same thing with oil, right? Like you're giving right. rights to that resource right. and you take well, a cut. And, you know, that's our, our other business, Peter's Forest Resources. I mean, we manage timberland for mostly privately owned, you know, families or individuals or, or privately owned corporations that are not involved in the timber business per se. And, and you know, as professional foresters, we manage that process for them. We'll go in and, and give them recommendations on what they should be doing to maximize their returns and if we need to, to compromise because of their wildlife concerns we work that into the plan as well we'll also uh, negotiate the sale with buyers we don't buy it ourselves we don't cut it ourselves we work strictly for a landowner and so you know we're their agent we're their advisor and their agent we'll take that timber sale from the advisory role all the way through you know sale preparation contract you know we negotiate the price for them uh make sure you know we've got good contracts in place and then we'll supervise the harvest farm and there's any reforestation needed on the back end we'll supervise that as well so so from what you're saying you advise on how they're gonna they can maximize their return do you also facilitate the execution of that plan yes okay i yes. i didn't know if you, like, if you go out there and be like hey man you got to cut the grass good luck <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We, we'll facilitate. We'll, it's a turnkey operation if they want us to do that. We'll give them the advice. And, and then once they approve the plan, we'll take it and go from there. We'll, we'll do the preparation, which means defining what we're going to cut, whether it's, you know, marking the sale boundary on the ground, uh, defining, you know, the thinning, what are we going to take out? What are we going to leave? We'll negotiate prices with buyers for them on their behalf. We'll get the contracts put in place for them, and then we'll supervise the harvest as it's as it's happening. Sure. So as you're you know as you're going through this process, um, what are, are what are a few like common deal breakers, I guess, um, that that you see on these properties, and are are there, are, are there any that uh, stick out in your mind as you know exemplary deal breakers, things that you remember? Yeah, like we talked about red flags. I wonder about the ones that are like, nah. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that, you know, I said, I don't buy timber. I don't cut the timber myself. And and I think in, in 95 or probably maybe 99% of the instances, the landowner is well served to have somebody like me working for them, between them and the landowner. Because they don't, if you own 500 acres, you're not selling timber very often. You don't do it often enough to really know what's going on. You don't know the markets. You don't, and like any business, there's mostly good guys in it, but there's some bad guys in the logging business. Most of them are good, but I don't care where you go, there's going to be a bad guy in any there's, business. There's always that one, right? Yeah, or two or whatever. And, and, you know, you need to know who those guys are, who to stay away from, and you need to know how to watch them and how to pay attention. And so, you know, over the 40 years I've been doing this business, I can't, I can't count the number of times somebody called me and say, well, Billy down the road called me up and offered me $50,000 for my timber. And when it's all said and done, they hired me and they got $70,000 after they paid me. You know, so it's just an experience that, you know, most people don't sell their own house because they don't know what they're doing. They go get hire a realtor to sell their house. Same thing with the land business. They hire us at National Land Realty to sell their land because we're going to generally get more for it than they could on their own. That makes a lot of sense. Um, things on the land to look for that would break a deal like so if i'm looking at purchasing land would it be i mean like i i could imagine rights to timber probably plays a role i don't yeah. know if you can set those rights i mean i, I mean you can set rights for anything right okay. um so so that is probably one is there is there others like um you know are you, are you looking at access for logging trucks to that site or 
Yeah, you need to have access to it, you know, whether it's public access or at least legal access. And you know, legal access has to be capable of handling logging equipment. You know, you start running logging trucks, you're talking 80, 90,000 pound trucks. You got to be able to get them in and out. You know, if you got a bridge, it, you're scared to drive across in your pickup truck. You know, I'm not it's saying don't buy it, that. but understand you're going to spend a hundred grand building a bridge before you start cutting timber. Or soft shoulders or something like that too. That's right. right. And, and, you know, internal, good internal roads are a plus, a huge plus. You go to sell timber, if I've already got good gravel roads that'll hold up, I'm going to get more from my timber because the logging company doesn't have to fight that road. They don't have to spend a bunch of time and effort maintaining that road. You know, we managed a property for, for years and years and years that had a superior network of internal roads. They spent a fortune on gravel roads. But over about 20 years, we generated about 15% higher returns on that piece of property than we did on a piece of property that would be similar with poor roads. Just because you thought out the access. Well, they, they, and they maintain the access. Right. Landowners maintain, they kept the roads gravel, they kept them clean, they kept them graded. The logger, the, the logger got there and he could go to work. He didn't have to build a road. Road's already there. He didn't have to spend money building a road. I got you. It, you mentioned before, you said that somebody with 500 acres is not going to know the market as well because they won't be harvesting as often. Correct. What is, what is sort of the, the, the sweet spot? Like if, if I'm going to call something a timber investment, what's my minimum, my minimum acreage that I'm looking at? Well, I mean, you can do, you can call a hundred acres of timber investment. You just got to understand, <laughs> understand what it is that you're not going to generate income, but periodic. If you want to generate income regularly on an annual basis, you're probably going to, you know, you're going to need, you know, a couple, two or 3,000 acres or more. Um, and even and so that you can rotate your cuts, right? That's right. Even two or yeah. 3,000 acres is likely not going to generate harvest income every year. You know, it may, you may need 10,000 acres to generate harvest a significant harvest income every year. Gotcha. And that's something to think about too. Like when, when somebody is looking at timber and like, let's say they buy something with, you know, all the trees on the, on the, cause I, I see things marketed as a timber investment and you'll see uh, all of the trees and they're maybe 15 feet tall. And yeah. Well, it's, it is a long, it is a, it, it could be a timber investment, but it's a long-term investment, you know? And my dad used to use the word patient capital, and that's what it takes, patient capital to buy a timberland investment. you got to be patient. If you buy 100 acres, you know, it's going to take you 30 years to, to fully realize your return on it. And, and I've heard of scenarios, too, where um, landowners are, are advised not to harvest but to sell the land based on potential harvest value to somebody who is more sort of experienced with timber harvest and preserve the timber and sell that. What are the situations for that? Like, like when should you, when should you look to harvest before you sell? Because there's, there's two points of income that you can gain from that. You can gain the income from the timber and then the income of the land sale, or some people, like I said, some people are advised to preserve the value of the timber and run the land sale with, with the expected price, of the timber on it. What's, how, how does that balance? Yeah, work? I think that depends on, on the nature of the investment. If it's a pure timberland investment and, you know, the recreational values are fairly low, you know, if it's fine plantation, you're managing it intensely, you know, like uh, a warehouser might do. If, you, if you've got something like that, if you're managing it very intensely, and your buyer is probably going to be somebody like you. It probably doesn't matter if, if the timber should be cut uh, for finance, you know, for because it's financially optimal to cut it. Or civil culturally, which means you need, you need to do some cutting because it's time based on the timber growth. I'd go ahead and cut it and manage it and do any reforestation necessary. And then you could put that in, back out in the market. And your, your market is pure timberland investors. They're going to understand what you did, why you did it. And now they're taking it to the next rotation. They're going to take it for the next 30 years. If it's a recreational timberland track, however, the value of those trees may be more standing on the ground and they get more for the trees selling them with the land because it's it's kind of a mental deal if the buyers oh this is a beautiful place if i go and cut the timber it's going to be ugly <laughs> not only is going to lose the value of the timber but now you're dealing with somebody that's 
trying to see 10 years down the road and try to envision what that's going to look like rather than going into it with a nice, pretty stand of trees. And, oh, that's great. That's beautiful. I'll, I'll, I'll buy it now. You know, it's, it's just a, it's a, a dollars and cents. You know, you can argue that it doesn't matter if you sell the timber separate from the land. But from a marketing standpoint, I see, and I, I recommend if it's a recreational timberland track, quite often I say, don't sell a timber. Let me use that as a marketing tool. Because, because of what it looks product. like and the, the experience that the land provides by That's having right. that timber. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Let, let me tell the next guy, you can cut some of this timber and get some of your money back. And he's probably going to pay you a little more than he would if you cut than you would get if you cut the timber and then sold him the bear land. Right, right. That makes a lot so that's that's exactly yeah. That makes a lot of sense that you know advising somebody like, man, don't get a wild hair and clear cut your whole property. Like you're not going to be able to sell it for nearly as much. That's right. Yeah. I mean so the it, pretty property is easier to sell than ugly. I mean that's just a fact. <laughs> <laughs> and and logging is it's terribly destructive. I mean, there's no way around it. It's ugly, it's messy, and it just it look, it just looks bad. So, from from everything you've told us today, Warren, it sounds like you know a timber investment can be a very flexible investment. You know, if you're looking for um, uh, more of a short term, like you know, buy it and then sell the merchantable timber with the land, you can do that. Or if you're looking to hold it, you know, for decades and harvest later, you could do that as well. It could be a hunting tract. It sounds like you know, timber is a very it's a very flexible investment. Absolutely. You know, you can accomplish lots of different investment goals with it, whether it's pure pure financial investment or it's it's that along with a place that you, you know, and you can't put money on recreation. You, you know, family time, kids fishing in the lake, killing their first deer, I, you know, that's worth a lot of money. Worth more to some people than others, but it's, you know. <laughs> well, that, and that, that seems to be one of the, things. I was going to say, that seems to be one of the keys with, with anything that has to do with land. So we've had a lot of conversations about mineral rights and, or even, you know, just had a, had a uh, interview we did a couple of weeks ago about, you know, commercial poultry farming. And right. what it comes down to is when you're working with land, any type of land, whether it's timber or anything else, like it's really up to you. It's, it's really, but one of the, one of the primary pieces is <laughs> got to make sure you have the right advice and the right consultancy right. along the way. Otherwise you can really mess it up. Yep. Um, Hey, I, you know, we're closing in on the hour here, uh, Norrin. I, I want to give you a chance. Someone's in in you know Mississippi area, Louisiana area, and and they need to. Uh, they they got a lot of trees. Who do they contact? How do they get well, a hold of me? You? Of course. All right. <laughs> you know me at, at National Land Realty, or me at Peter's Forest Resources, either one. And and you know, and I can't service everybody. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of knowledgeable. Uh, foresters out there, quite a few of them work for National Land Realty. Not all of them work for National Land Realty, but there's a lot of advice out there. And, and certainly anybody particularly uh, new into the timberland investment, uh, whether it's pure timber investment or recreational timberland, get some advice. Uh, it, it'll be well, You'll be well served with some professional advice. Awesome. Well, hey, Warren, I, I want to just extend my appreciation and thanks for, for taking the time to chat with us us boneheaded interviewers over here today. I, I appreciate you uh, dropping some knowledge on us. Um, and, and for those of you listening, you know, you, you're hearing 50 years of experience in forest management here. Um, this is, this is a pretty valuable sort of listen for you. Um, so Warren, I thank you very much. Well, I thank, thank you for the opportunity. I uh, enjoyed it. And uh, anybody out there that has some questions, I don't charge a whole lot for advice. And, and most of us at National Land Realty don't charge a whole lot for advice. So don't, don't hesitate to call. Nope. I'll, I'm going to have your contact information in the notes. Anybody that listens will see it. Thank you. Y'all have a good Thank weekend. You. you too. Thank you. All right, everyone. This concludes episode number seven of the National Land Realty podcast, discussing timber investments with National Land Realty land professional Warren Peters out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, let's just be honest here. If you listen to this whole podcast, you were privy to about 50 years of accumulated knowledge regarding timber. 
I, I can't emphasize how amazing it is to talk with land professionals about their areas of expertise. Uh, you can learn more about land ownership or the buying and selling of land at nationalland.com. 